evening and welcome to this panel discussion to learn from our leading educators about innovations in public education. My name is Fran Dyke, former president of the League of Women Voters of Portland. I will be moderating this evening's panel. This program is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund. The League works to protect democracy and to help preserve and promote our right to participate in government through understanding, voting, and speaking out on issues that affect our communities. This program is now being recorded by Metro East Community Media for rebroadcast and will soon be available for online viewing at the League of Women Voters of Portland's website, www.lwvpdx.org. Our program is supported by a grant from the Multnomah Barra Foundation and the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation. We are grateful for their support and the support of Multnomah County for providing this venue and the generosity of our speakers and our volunteers in bringing this program to you tonight. Our speakers bring different perspectives to the topic of innovation in public education. We will hear from these four distinguished and dedicated educators who have pioneered innovative ways to foster learning and equity for the students in our public schools. After our panelists have spoken, they will have a chance to comment or to question each other. I then may have some additional questions to ask and panelists will also answer questions submitted by you, the audience members. We encourage audience members to write their questions for the speakers on the index cards that, can, that are being distributed. Please raise your hand if you need a card, and when you have a card, raise your hand to have a league member pick it up. Our first speaker is Superintendent Guerrero of the Portland Public Schools. He started here in October of 2017 as the new superintendent of PPS, the largest and most diverse school district in Oregon. He brings to Portland his 25 years experience in education as a teacher and as a leader in large urban school systems such as San Francisco and Boston. As PPS superintendent, he has taken on major challenges, including converting eight schools into K-5 elementary schools and opening two comprehensive middle schools for grades six to eight. His teaching background has been instrumental in building in bridging the gaps with the teachers' unions and relating to the unique challenges of each school. Superintendent, you have 10 minutes to speak. Well, thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my appreciation to the League of Women Voters for the invitation to, to be here this evening uh, with you. Uh, I think you just heard a little bit about uh, my bio, uh, but I think it's also important uh, uh, to name a few other critical positions that I've held, uh, which include serving as a parent coordinator and community organizer, uh, which includes starting my uh, employment as a classroom aide uh, in an underserved community. And, and I mention those because they've been part of my journey uh, that informs sort of the theory of action I hold in, 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 in my head about um, some of the important ingredients that uh, can create uh, thriving schools. And, and what I mean by that is um, uh, ensuring the, the promise that public, educa public education can, can have, uh, particularly for students of color, to transcend their circumstances means that we can't take on that work alone. Uh, that work has to be in collaboration with what we call stakeholders, but what we mean is families, uh, with community leaders, uh, with community-based partnerships, uh, w with folks who are also uh, committed to the success of, of its community. And that was part of um, my early uh, career experiences, is, is, is doing that kind of work. Uh, whether as a classroom aide or eventually a Spanish bilingual teacher who understood uh, that just because students are developing competence in a second language didn't mean that they didn't have an abundant intelligence and potential uh, to achieve. Um, or as a principal uh, taking on a turnaround school uh, in an underserved community who knew that 
uh, it was not a time to get reductionist about the approach, that these were students who deserved as whole an education as we could provide them. So that's why it was important to me to not just reinforce a strong academic agenda, but also make sure that arts education was part of their experience, that mental and behavioral health supports were there for our students who might be experiencing some readiness to learn challenges, to focus on building relational trust uh, with parents and family and community who perhaps may not have had their own positive experience with the school community historically. And in my work, either as an assistant superintendent or a deputy superintendent, and taking those learnings and thinking about uh, how do we inform a systemic uh, approach to supporting many, many schools like that at scale. How do we leverage the, the resources we do have available uh, in very evidence-based ways? Uh, and how do we go about that work from a collective impact approach? Um, so that our students have an experience uh, that will ensure that by the time they walk across uh, the stage that uh, they are prepared to lead the world. Uh, and that's actually the title of our new vision at PPS. So we are at a pivotal time in Oregon and in particular uh, in Portland Public Schools. Uh, we're going about not just a physical transformation with the modernization of many of our facilities, which are exciting citadels of learning for both our educators and our students, uh, but our work itself, uh, we are asking to, to be reimagined. Uh, when you walked in uh, this evening, you may have uh, picked up, I wanted to make sure you had a takeaway this evening, uh, what is the product of a year's worth of work uh, with our community? Uh, it's a new community-defined vision. Uh, for our students, Portland Public Schools reimagined. And um, some of what the students, educators, and community members who participated, uh, a broad coalition of 100 uh, folks from across uh, this, uh, the community spoke clearly about uh, some of the skills and dispositions that their hopes uh, uh, were there for, for our graduates. And it's not what you might typically expect uh, as an outcome. Uh, it describes in the graduate portrait that our students will be empathetic, that they will be global stewards, uh, that they will have a connected sense of self, that they'll be lifelong learners, that they'll be racial equity leaders. And so we have what is the we now refer to as the graduate portrait, uh, not unlike some of the vision statements that, that some uh, urban districts uh, are committing to uh, these days, uh, but we took it two steps further. We said we actually can't produce a graduate like this unless we also focus on the educators and how we support them. So we also came up uh, sort of to go uh, one layer out, the educator essentials. And our teachers themselves were very helpful in identifying that if I'm going to produce those kinds of students, I also have to uh, be able to cultivate, cultivate that kind of adaptive, resilient characteristic in our students. Yes, I'll need to make sure and cover the core knowledge of academics, but I also want to make sure that I'm able to make sure that our students are self-aware, that they're reflective. Uh, that they're able to, uh, that I'm able to create an inclusive learning environment for, for diverse learners. And so we don't want to just put the responsibility for achieving that kind of a graduate portrait just on our students or our educators, because it implies that there also has to be some system shifts uh, by the organization itself. And so that's why we also call out what those sh system shifts also need to entail if we're going to orchestrate the kind of uh, outcomes that, that we want to see in our students. So we talk about things like uh, building future-focused environments, uh, ensuring that our schools are community hubs, uh, that our systems are taking racial equity uh, lenses to the decisions that, that we make. And so you can, you can read many of those descriptions. So I just wanted to start off in my intro by talking about we're, we're excited about uh, the vision that, that we have moving forward uh, sort of as a community's mandate. Uh, our task uh, at the moment is to develop a multi-year strategic and business plan that actually accompanies this document. So we actually see it through. 
Uh, otherwise, it's just a beautiful vision, but without execution, uh, that's not going to become a reality for our students. So this is a lofty aspiration, we believe, but we also believe uh, that it's possible if we um, uh, take all the resources at hand and all the thought partners uh, that are out there uh, towards this shared mission and goal. So uh, that's one area um, as we get into the conversation would, would be happy to talk about some of the others because uh, the educators and the leaders that, that will need to carry this out uh, also need to have their own skill set cultivated and we need to build off a lot of the assets and the strengths that we do have in our human capital uh, and that means we have to put a real primary focus on our workforce development uh, and the leadership development and ensuring that those leaders also reflect the student demographic that they serve. And so uh, call it innovative, but paying attention to our educational leaders to take on this kind of challenging work uh, is not often attended to uh, in, a, in a thoughtful way. And so we want to make sure that, that we try to do that. Uh, and we're partnering with some highly respected national organizations to, to bring those learnings and those opportunities uh, to, to our, both our aspiring leaders as well as those who have already chosen this. As, as a career uh, with a especially mindful attention to uh, making sure that we're also attracting educators, leaders uh, of color along the way and the kind of mentoring and support uh, that we know makes a difference for folks like us. Um, so there's, there's the workforce development and the leadership development. And then how do we continue to uh, seek those resources and partnerships that are going to help advance our overall agenda? Uh, Portland Public Schools, and we haven't put out a press release, recently was named uh, into the League of Innovation Schools, the Digital Promise Schools, and it's a commitment that we understand that to engage in this kind of work, that uh, technology is going to be an important backbone. And so as we identify some of those digital district elements and how they'll support not just student learning but also adult learning and how they might help to alter and shift the learning environment to uh, inspire our students and use those tools to be creative. I was just at our students' uh, first ever film festival yesterday and we have some very talented individuals. So I feel the optimism and the excitement that I think uh, our students and our educators are, are feeling these days on our campus. And I know that our community also has uh, as we continue to, to go about this work. Hey, thank you, uh, Superintendent Guerrero. I, um, I'm sure you're all getting questions written down, so when it's time for question and answer, we can have those. And then our next speaker is Superintendent Matthew Uterbach, superintendent of North Clackamas School District. He has over 29 years in public education in the North Clackamas School District. A superint as superintendent, he was recognized as the 2017 National School Superintendent of the Year. Congratulations. A suburban school district serving over 17,000 students on 33 school campuses, North Clackamas has become an innovation leader in core curricular areas in career and technical education, and in working with principals and teachers to create supportive learning environments. Um, it's your turn for 10 minutes now. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. And I also, too, would like to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for the work that you do uh, in promoting democracy in our, in our country. Uh, the North Clackamas School District is located just south of Portland, uh, and as, it was, as was referenced, uh, a little over 17,000 students in a fairly diverse community. Um, our student achievement results consistently outpace uh, the state of Oregon. Uh, we have the highest attendance rates of the 15 largest school districts in the state, uh, and almost 90% of our freshmen are on track to graduate. Uh, and our graduation rate has increased by nearly 20% uh, since 2011. Uh, and we have virtually closed the graduation gap for students of color in our school district. In 2018, the graduation rate for our black and African American students was 97%. We have the largest professional technical center uh, in the state of Oregon. 
and if we can get our students into a second year course uh, at our uh, professional technical center, their graduation rate is 92%. With this success has come a lot of community support. In 2016, our community passed nearly a $433 million capital construction bond uh, that is touching every one of our facilities in our district. And in 2018, we passed our first local option levy. So what I want to uh, address today is uh, this idea that successful education requires meeting the needs of the whole child through the lens of equity. And I think you're gonna hear that from all four panelists uh, today. Um, and I really f uh, highlighted kind of six areas that I think uh, are garnering attention in our school district. This first is systemic systems of support. Um, our students are coming today, coming to us today with some significant challenges. Um, trauma, uh, they're at, uh, many of our students are at risk. We know that Oregon has one of the highest suicide rates uh, for youth in the country. Um, and so as a school system, uh, we need to be determining how we provide counseling mental health support uh, to our students. Social emotional learning, uh, family resource centers and student-based health centers are critical uh, for the success of our students. Teacher uh, support and development. Uh, we know nationally that 50% of uh, new teachers leave the profession within the first five years. Uh, that is not a great return on, on that investment. And so um, how do we support new teachers uh, and how do we develop new teachers is critical, I believe, for the success of public education today. And I can talk more about that if you have questions. Uh, we're moving, uh, as, as all school districts are, to a curriculum that is heavily based in technology. Uh, we are no longer purchasing textbooks. Our textbooks are all online, and we're virtually a, we're getting close to a one-on-one -on -one device for each of our students in our school system, uh, and they're accessing their technology about anywhere. Uh, they can access it at home, their curriculum. They can access it uh, in our schools, in different places in our schools, and that, that's exciting. It also allows us to tailor our curriculum to meet the needs of our students. I reference current technical education. Uh, it's critical uh, that students have a rigorous and relevant educational experience, and uh, we need to continue to expand that in our state. Early learning opportunities are also critical. Uh, we need to get more and more students into early childhood education systems, whether that's preschool, uh, whether that's jumpstart programs before kids enter public education. But what I really want to talk tonight about is creating inclusive learning environments for each of our students. And that really is where I think uh, we've experienced much of our success uh, in our school district. What we know um, is that uh, a student's gender and their skin color, their home language, and their parents' income level continues to be the predictor of who graduates and who doesn't graduate from our school systems. And we must have a commitment to the success of each student, right? uh, every single one of them. And this requires us to have intentional action, action that identifies and removes barriers to student success. And we recognize uh, in our school district that a student's experience in our schools is impacted by their identity. Right? And so when we know that, um, it really becomes clear for us on what's our why. Um, our why and our work has to be about the development of the human being. Uh, it's about ensuring that when students leave us that they have the opportunity for social uplift. It's about giving them a voice in this world and it's about them being empowered to claim their humanity. And I believe our students are counting on us to put in place the conditions and the environments for this to happen. And our job as educators, right, is to put in place the conditions, right, for that to happen. So how do we unpack uh, what I would say are the dominant norms and systems and attitudes that leave a lot of our students uh, in our schools and our community feeling vulnerable uh, and fearful to simply live life authentically? how they identify themselves. And our job is seeking answers to that question. Um, and in North Clackamas, our equity work has really been driven uh, on these key uh, areas. And Guadalupe talked about uh, workforce diversification is critical. We know that if students have uh, uh, teachers that look like them, they're much likely, more likely to graduate uh, from that school system. Our uh, professional development must be deeply embedded in equity, uh, particularly race-based equity, and helping our staff and our community understand the impacts that race have on student achievement. 
We need to make sure that we're using an equity lens in our decision-making process. Who are we including in the process? Are we ignoring or worsening existing disparities um, uh, are critical. We need to look at gathering stakeholder voice uh, in our school systems, our parents, our community members, and our students. Um, in this day and age, uh, we better be very skilled at responding to racialized incidences that happen in our communities, in our country, and in our schools, because our students are being impacted by those on a daily basis. We need to look at detracking our systems and who, which students are we setting up for success and which students are we not setting up for success. And finally, we need to look at the implementation of culturally responsive pedagogy. And that's really what I want uh, to talk about uh, tonight. We can get, there we go. Uh, culturally relevant pedagogy is really grounded uh, by three pillars. Those pillars are academic achievement, cultural competence, and social political consciousness. Uh, and when we look at each one of those, I'll, I'll try to define it for you a little bit more clearly. That first pillar of academic achievement, uh, it really leads to demonstrable growth in required subjects that teachers are focused on academic mastery. We must have a belief, our teachers need to have a belief that all students can and must experience a rigorous academic uh, program. That teachers need to know their content, they must know their learner, and they must know how to teach the content to the learner. They must think deeply about what they teach, while, why they are teaching it, what resources they're using to teach it, and how they're going to teach it based upon who their students are as people and learners really focusing on the individual. The second pillar is uh, cultural competence. And this is a firm grounding in one's culture while learning, um, while also acquiring fluency in at least one additional culture. Students must have command of cultural competence, the ability to understand their own cultural identities and lenses and to interact effectively with others who are different from them. Cultural competence requires that teachers understand their own cultural backgrounds and actively learn about those backgrounds of their students. In doing so, teachers not only affirm their students' lived experiences, but also empower stu their students by using their students' culture as the basis for learning. When cultural competence is played out as it should, students feel respected and affirmed in their multiple identities and here's the key, in return, respect and affirm the multiple identities of others. And finally, pillar number three is social political uh, consciousness. This is the ability to use school knowledge to solve relevant social, cultural, civic, uh, environmental, and political problems, or the ability to answer, why do we have to learn this? Students must develop critical consciousness that allows them to challenge the status quo of the current social order. With support, students can turn awareness into power. And when we implement these pillars of cultural pedagogy effectively and with fidelity, we move beyond majority rules. What we want uh, will also move from a system of equality to equity to liberation. Sorry, I'm having a little tough time with the, can you move it for me? Thank you. <laughs> what we all want, we all want to live our lives with dignity and safety and surrounded by those we love. We want to have purpose and the freedom to advance dreams for ourselves and for our community's children. And that is liberation. And I believe that is the goal, uh, should be the goal of public education today. Um, when we address, when we implement culturally relevant pedagogy, uh, we create systems of liberation, and we move from school systems that are schooling our students to systems that are educating our students. And I can't say it any better than Jeff Duncan Andrade when he says, schooling is the process by which you institutionalize people to accept their place in a society. Education is the process through which you teach them to transform it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. Our next speaker is Mr. Kevin Bacon, director of 3 to PhD Collaborative. Director Bacon has spent 33 year, years of his life working in dedication to improving student outcomes and community engagement. His experience includes classroom teaching, student management, biotechnology education coordination, 
vice principal, and principal. The collaborative that he directs now is the first of its kind in the country. Three to PhD stands for three-year-old preschool children up to students pursuing their highest dreams, hence PhD. He directs an innovative partnership between Concordia University and Portland Public Schools Fabian School, leading and fostering initiatives that engage multiple stakeholders to ensure whole child development. You now have 10 minutes. Ooh, better go. <laughs> um, wow, thank you uh, for that welcome, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for asking me to address tonight's gathering. Um, a huge thanks to Superintendent Guerrero, Superintendent Utterback for, um, for your words. I think that um, first and foremost, three to PhD really is a microcosm of what what you both just explained, and in particular, um, three to PhD without the support of the superintendent and the approval of the Portland Public School School Board, we wouldn't be able to to operate operationally. And so, um, um, being here tonight is really an extension of of Portland Public Schools, and also. Um, the other backbone partner of, of our collaborative is Concordia University, with Fabian being across the street from Concordia University. They have a long history of working um, with that elementary school, and we're instrumental in partnering with Portland Public Schools to bring 3 to PhD to life. And I am a new, I wasn't there at the beginning. I have uh, kind of been handed the reins um, um, in this last year, and um, one of uh, one of my crucial colleagues and partners uh, leading that work, who I appreciate being here, uh, if you could raise your hand, Dr. Williams. She is the principal of Fabian School, and uh, we have developed a really close relationship to to really make um, everything um, come true that. Um, Superintendent Guerrero and, and Utterback have outlined. And so um, I, I haven't said anything that's on my script. <laughs> but so what I want to do right now is, is really get to a video just to really try to capture, um, let's see if we can get it to play. Welcome to
it's really hard to wrap to wrap your, your brains around uh, this new facility that houses everything that you saw in that video. And so to show the video to those who haven't had the opportunity to visit the school uh, is really the only way to give you an idea of, of what 3D PhD looks like on the inside. As a retired principal, actually I retired last summer, and this is what retirement looks like. Um, you know, the, the position of director was, was posted and um, um, had the opportunity to apply and did that really inspired by the fact that I know that every principal across this country is hustling to find resources for the kids and the families that they serve. And those that had the vision for 3 to PhD um, really found a way to bring this all together in one place, right? And so when this Sunday I'm reading the paper and I'm, I'm reading about um, suicide rates in our state, and I'm reading about hunger in our state, I'm hearing about uh, the need for mental health services, you know, I can tell you that Kaiser Permanente coming on board as a partner, they brought full medical and full dental inside that school and we're up to about a 25% usage rate right now of families taking advantage of that service. And was in some neat meetings this summer where, where not only could Kaiser as a result of the data sharing um, um, give us usage rates, but we were able to start to look at students who had vi visited the Wellness Center and also students in Fabian who have Kaiser insurance, and we were able to start looking at some data of visits to their doctors and ties to student learning. And it's really in an infancy right now, but the potential for us to really cross-reference um, medical data with instructional and student learning is really an opportunity that I think can, can, can inform um, down the road. Uh, we have Trillium Family Services that's a partner in this. We have two full-time mental health therapists who saw um, up to 15 percent of the, of the student body last year. And we know how important that is going forward with um, everything we're learning. Uh, about ACES and trauma-informed care, and having that in the building, especially as a um, um, as a referral opportunity for the principal and her staff, is is really huge. Uh, Basics Food Market, um, Basics Food Market Club, we 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 have to call it a club because of zoning. Uh, that was the first of their chain. Some of you might know they have a store on Sandy Boulevard. Some of you might know they have one out in Tualatin. They're breaking ground, I think, in Beaverton, or maybe you already have one in Beaverton. Um, but that store accepts food stamps. It accepts WIC. It provides uh, organic and healthy food options. Uh, that store is available to not only Fabian students and their families, but also um, um, Concordia, the college students. Uh, the uh, uh, second mission, in addition to wrapping around the Fabian students, is, is the mission of developing teachers. So the College of Education, and this is really what sets us apart from a lot of other models across the country. The College of Education is co-located inside the school. So on the three floors of the school, you have college students who are studying to be educators and teachers on those same floors. So you'll see a freshman um, who wants to be a teacher one day walking to, to class at the same time as a first grader. You know, and on all three floors, uh, a, a junior in the College of Education walking to school, walking to class alongside a seventh or an eighth grader. And as a result of that immersive experience, um, when, these, when these teachers land in their first classrooms, that deer in the headlight look is not quite as like it was for me when I first landed in my first classroom. And so, um, we are looking at wrapping around Fabian students to increase student learning and also, and I, I got the sign for one minute, but this triangle here, all the educators in the room knows this is the instructional core. And the tighter this triangle can be, um, the more student, le more student learning goes up. And we know every district, every principal, um, every classroom teacher is working to tighten this triangle. So three to PhD, our 
a, there's lots of visuals, ways to see 3D PhD, but 3D PhD wraps itself through that instructional core. And we don't lead it. I am not the principal, and I remind her of that all the time. She tries to give me a walkie-talkie, and I run from the walkie-talkie. And uh, But we work together. I work with the dean. The three of us, we were in a meeting together with both their teams. We have that opportunity to talk about the top of that triangle, the teacher. We, got, we have the opportunity to talk about teacher development. We have the opportunity to talk about the student at the corner of that. And obviously, re reducing, you know, lowering food, food insecurity, increasing access to, to health care, mental health services really helps with how students are showing up. And then the curriculum side, we have an opportunity to really um, support the school and its efforts to develop STEAM education and problem-based problem learning. Um, and that's making sure it's aligned with what the district is doing. We have district people who are on our council. And so I do a lot of meetings with, with uh, uh, the district office and um, to make sure things are aligned and, and working, uh, um, working together. Innovation is, is, you know, if you're gonna be on the edge, you gotta have the support of the people around you. And, and Kaiser, Basics, Trillium, Portland Public Schools, Concordia um, have been instrumental in that. And um, so we're, 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 we're continuing to, to evolve. Thank you, sorry for going over. Thank you. I, I don't think I was the only one who wanted to get up and dance when we saw those wonderful <laughs> children and teachers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ms. L Ms. Lisa Collins, who is an educational consultant. Ms. Collins is currently with Portland State University, having designed and is now leading the mentorship program for administrators of color. Her areas of expertise include de developing learning materials and curricula, facilitating groups, building community, and reaching special populations, such as new employees, underserved groups, and those with learning challenges. Her 25 years of experience is a teacher, a mentor, an administrator, and a consultant. Her creative approach to problem solving and her passion for quality and equity experiences for each student make her a valuable professional research for our community. It's your turn for 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, first, thank you for asking me to come and share and with this um, very, um, I don't know what to say about you guys, but um, <laughs> I was going to say something nice, but a word's not coming to mind, but, but these prominent gentlemen. And uh, I, I really, I've worked with uh, Matt and with Kevin very closely, and um, I, I really appreciate, and uh, Superintendent from PPS, I appreciate everything that I've heard today. And, you know, what I think about um, innovation and education, and when I um, got the topic, I thought, wow, how can I talk about innovation in education unless I go back a little bit? And I promise I won't bore you with too much history, but I just want to just think about, in order to understand educational institutions today and the foundations of what these gentlemen are talking about, uh, what comes to mind is an article from Bridget Kernson. Um, I'm going to reference three different um, data or articles, and they're easy to find. Um, but her article written in 2011, when I read it, it really spoke to me. And the name of the article is When Pedagogy and Policy Collide. And in, 19, uh, in the 1960s when um, desegregation happened, uh, the, uh, President Johnson wrote an uh, act, the Education uh, it was the Secondary and uh, Elementary Education Act. And in that act, it superimposed things that should happen at schools. And the reason I mention this is that you know some of these things that have occurred since that time that happen at schools. Uh, no Child Left Behind. Um, Every Student um, Succeeds Act. Those are examples of policies, federal policies or mandates that come down to a school district and they need to follow them. And so when I talk, when I think about edu when I think about innovation, we have to look at federal policies and state mandates that actually superimpose some great idea I had last year, but now I need to change it. And I know these gentlemen that are sitting here today are really um, good at spinning the plates to try to make it happen 
for the community and for schools. So I just want to just, uh, one of the things she said in the article, she talked about teaching, about the love of teaching. I love teaching. I love it, adults, kids, it doesn't matter. I've taught elementary, middle, and high school, and now I'm working with college students or people that are just, just finished their um, administrative license. So teaching is an art. And when we take policy and we put put it on top of teaching, something gets lost in translation. And I'm just going to bring up one more thing. I'm not going to drone on ab about history, but I think it's important to understand if you want to lean into school districts and you want to lean into education, you need to actually understand what's happening there. And when these policies and state mandates are coming down and school districts are dealing with them, it's not necessarily that the public knows about every one of them. They may not know about any of them. Before I came here today, I was at soccer. Uh, my son was um, had soccer practice. I'm an assistant coach, and we took soccer pictures. And one of the moms said to me, oh my God, she said, I said, I'm, I have to get downtown. And she said, I had such a hard time with the dyslexia stuff that happened. And we pulled our kid out, and we paid money to try to help, and that was worse. And I said, well, there was a actually a policy that came down that said that schools were going to help you and that teachers were going to be trained. It didn't get to her. So I guess the crux of what I want to, well, I'm going to say about three, three things. I'm going to talk about the history. I'm going to talk about moving forward. I'm going to talk about math because I think math is a barrier. And I'm going to talk about how do, how are we going to be innovative? How are we going to be innovative? So now that you know that you have some idea about the policy, and these things you can look up online yourself, and you know that schools are dealing with policies, then where are we? Where are we? Who are we missing? And when we look at our state data, and this data is available online, you can look and see where does Oregon stand um, right now? What, whatever testing, and we know from these policies, one of the policies would be a nation at risk. Uh, does anybody remember a nation at risk in the 1980s? You know, we're in trouble, we need to teach different, and there comes standardized tests, right? And so when I looked at the ODE data for the state, for the state report card for the whole state, this is not individual school districts or schools, the area of math is a barrier for us. Now, it's a barrier because it predicts whether students are going to go to post-secondary. And we want students to go to post-secondary because we want them to have a good life, like Matt talked about. We want them to be healthy citizens and be able to have good, good health care and things like Kevin talked about, right? And so when math is not being um, accelerated, then we have a problem. So for instance, if you look at the ODE state report card on page 25 through 29, you will see that our 11th graders last year, 34.4 pass math. Uh, our sixth to eighth graders, 41 percent. Our third to fifth graders, 43.7 percent. Our goal, and it said long-term goal, is 80 percent. And if you are a minority student or a special ed student, you're way lower. You're way lower than that. And so when I think about innovation, I think about um, like um, uh, um, Guadalupe talked about, I think about communities. And I think about how are we using our communities to lean in to the things that need to happen for kids. And with our minority students and our special ed students, we know that we do not have any teachers or administrators, not to the fact that our students are growing, that are working inside our schools. Why is that? I think the elephant in the middle of the room is that are we really asking the hard questions about why people teach for a year and then move away? And we need to really start to unravel that. As I'm working with the, with the new leaders at PSU, and I will not tell any stories today, but the stories that I hear of their experiences are not good. And I so appreciate educators that, and leaders that are committed to equity. And equity is an action, not just a word. Equity is having the tough conversations and wrapping around the people of color that are working in the schools to help them feel safe so that they can reach the kids. 
And I think that that right there is very valuable. I look forward to working with North Clackamas when Dr. Um, Muhammad Khalifa is going to come, and he is going to um, he is going to teach forty over forty leaders, including um, Tigard and um, Salem, around culturally responsive leadership. And he's going to do that by going and looking at the history and then looking at policy. How can we be innovative? I think we could be innovative by, this is an excellent example, and the math example that I gave. The math example is, well, what does math look like in school nowadays? Does anybody really know? I just remember people, like they have the new math, and then they have this other math, and then they have a math that spirals. Really, the, the test has changed. Really what we want kids to know my grandfather used to say, you need to know how to count your money. That's what he used to say. We want kids to know. We want them to know how to be critical thinkers and how to be problem solvers. Why can't we do that in the community? Why can't people that are sitting here today lean in at your mosque, at your synagogue, at your church, or wherever you gather, even on the soccer field, to talk about those critical thoughts around kicking the ball in the goal? We can do that. I propose if we took one, one standard, one standard of critical thinking for one of the little, the little classes over at Fabian or for the whole city and we all leaned in to whatever kid we knew and we worked on it, we looked at them developmentally, are their eyes tracking? Well, if their eyes are not tracking, they can't read. We don't check that. How are there, is there movement okay? All of these things that we don't check around development, if we looked at that and everyone in this room and in the city leaned in on one standard, I bet you we'd move that dial in math. I think innovation is communities, not just communities in the schools, communities out of the schools, leaning in to really know what's going on in our schools and for our families. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends the presentations from the panelists, and I'm going to ask them to um, ask questions of each other, because I'm sure that something from each person stood out for each of you. And we'll take about 10 minutes to do that, and then we'll switch to audience questions. But before we start, I would like to commend four people who collectively have 112 years of experience <laughs> working to build quality and equitable education. Thank you very much. So you're all successful people, so I know you're not shy. So who'd like to take the first question to one of your co-panelists? I'll, I'll do that. I, um, um, this is for both, both Matt and Guadalupe. And Guadalupe being from the San Francisco, you know, recently being from the San Francisco area. And then Matt, I saw you had a, a quote from Jeff uh, Duncan Andrade. And um, when I was still in my principal world, um, we had him come and talk to a staff, and I'm just wondering, um, both of your experiences with him, and is there anything around innovation that, 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 that you learned from him or that you had dialogue about um, with some of the work they're doing with the, the Teaching Ex Excellence Network, 10, or just you guys being in the same room with him, any, any thoughts about that? Well, I think Duncan Andrade and, and many others out there are reminding us to think about the purpose of education, right? He's pretty clear. Uh, education is liberation. Uh, you can go all the way back to Paulo Freire and others. Uh, but I think somewhere along the line, um, uh, we, we've forgotten that it, it is about that empowerment for, uh, but it's for all students, right? And so, um, when Jeff describes the, the current American public education system, what we all realize is that it's perfectly designed to get the outcomes that it's getting. So uh, these disparities are not by accident. And so uh, this is why we use the word reimagine a lot. And so what's innovative is to actually be attentive to the needs of every student. And so it's not that we don't know how to teach reading. But why is it that not every student, particularly those of darker complexion, often aren't literate? 
right? And so how do we really look at our work through a racial equity lens uh, where, where we, we expect to see every one of our students uh, successful? And so we really have to look inward uh, about how we play school uh, in, in a way that thinks much more creatively about, about this effort that we're embarked on. So you described tonight, Kevin, uh, a school that's uh, sort of taken on this full service community school model and then you've added on top of it a professional lab school and it all makes sense because you're attending not just to the academic needs, uh, the social emotional learning needs, uh, the other readiness to learn challenges, but it's a place where not just students but also the adults are engaged in learning all day long. And so you're also preparing uh, uh, teachers who I believe will have a better uh, retention rate themselves and will persist in the profession because uh, they're actually thinking about this uh, in, in a way many other professions do by having that time to be in residence uh, to serve under the wing of uh, more expert practitioners and really getting that experience and having the time to think about many of these questions uh, themselves. Uh, I'm not always sure what the apprehension is to make sure every single one of our students uh, is successful, um, but I think we, we would be living in a different reality if, if every one of them were fully empowered to, to serve as leaders uh, in this world. So we're starting to see some examples of that now where our youth don't see uh, among themselves many of those barriers, and it's something we want to encourage uh, in youth leadership, I think many, uh, just to pick one topic as an example, uh, the global climate issues that, that uh, are really consuming a lot of our, our, our youth's uh, attention. I think many of you know that here locally there's uh, a planned day of action this coming Friday. And um, we really encourage our students to think critically about this issue because it's going to affect them certainly much more than us. Uh, we've left them with this dilemma to, to try to um, resolve, uh, but they're speaking out of, about it. Uh, they certainly want to raise awareness. They're thinking critically about it. This is a real world problem. Uh, they're being empathetic with the needs of frontline communities out there. Uh, and so all the things that we talk about as skill sets and dispositions that we want our students to have is actually something that they're applying right now as they organize. And so how do we leverage each of these moments as, as, as a learning opportunity, as a teaching moment? And then more importantly, how do we as the leaders and the educators actually support that effort? Because in fact, what they are arguing for is liberation and a brighter future. So. Um, I, I think Jeff and others have it right. Uh, how do we redesign the system itself so that uh, both the students and the adults uh, are engaged in an experience that maybe isn't the Prussian model that emerged in America uh, in previous centuries? Matt, um, part of the question was to you, and then Lisa will give you a chance. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with much of, of what uh, Guadalupe referenced there. Um, you know, Jeff uh, Duncan Andrade talks about this, uh, I, you know, idea of of education as being transformative for our students, and uh, others talk about this idea of liberation. And liberation really is going; it's about creating new systems. Uh, it it is about uh, naming, acknowledging, addressing our own privilege, um, and. It's about us allowing ourselves uh, to build bigger tables, uh, new tables where everyone's included and uh, where everyone is empowered, where everyone has a voice. And I think that's kind of at the, at the heart of, of liberation, uh, this idea where power is shared. And um, that's big. <laughs> that's the you know that's a big idea and we start gener you know we have an impact on that in public education um and i don't remember who said this but you know education is about um developing deep roots in our students um and what we mean by that is i think for a long time education um was above the ground development 
Uh, they talk about, you know, they've got maybe strong trunks and big branches, um, but we weren't developing roots in our students, that below the ground development. And that below, below ground development, you know, is that uh, ability to understand one's culture, uh, one's experiences, as well as those of others, uh, and then being able to use that to help transform uh, their outcome. And I think, uh, you know, be critical thinkers, be critical problem solvers, be advocates uh, to fix uh, many of the problems that uh, my generation, the generations before me have, have left our students with. Lisa, and then Kevin, you'll get to wrap up after, it was your question. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Kevin, for that, for that question about Jeff. I absolutely adore him. And uh, the Carnegie Conference, uh, in 2017, I was there when Jeff was speaking, and I sobbed through his whole talk. <laughs> Just, what he spoke about is he spoke about something that hit me to the core, that when students are understood, and when students are accepted, and when students have a sense of belonging, that's when they can learn. And he talked about the mole culture, and about how they learn their culture first, and when their grades start to dip, they go back to learn their culture some more. And so there's a two-fold double-edged sword for me as a black American woman whose grandfather was a sharecropper in Arkansas, is that I didn't learn my culture. I didn't learn it in school. And um, I learned some in college, and then I became a self-learned person where I continue to learn. But I think about our students, and Jeff is very articulate about this, um, that our students need that. He talked about them being from warrior cultures. And then soon as they raise their voice or say something, they're in trouble. And they're suspended. And they're excluded. So Jeff is the real deal. Um, when I left, after sobbing during his talk, he, he hugged me afterwards, <laughs> and him and I did have some conversation. And what he, um, seeing him and hearing him, and that talk is online, 2017 Carnegie Education Summit, made me um, realize I can do more. I can do more. And even when it gets hard, I can get up and do some more. <laughs> Jeff will be in Oregon next Wednesday at the Statewide Equity Conference oh, in I'll Salem. Be there so. for sure. I will Kevin, would you like to wrap up your question in any way? Well, I think, you know, if with the League of Women Voters being about democracy, I mean, I, I, I met lots of pre-K and kindergartners who know how to say that's not fair. And, um, <laughs> and, and how lots of pre-K and kindergartners who like to say, that's not fair, and, and, and that means what they're telling us is that they want to participate. And oftentimes, instead of tell me more about that, um, that turns into sit down and be quiet, which then turns into um, some sort of call home to the parent. And then that, you know, the, the trajectory for that student who wants to just question and, and know more about their purpose and and what's happening to them um, sometimes is looked upon as, as insubordination. And too many of our kids that don't, that aren't ready to walk in a straight line or, or um, sit on the carpet totally, I mean, and, and are incredibly bright, just uh, um, they get the wrong message about who they are as learners and, and people. And we gotta do a better job. Thank you all for that thoughtful conversation. And it leads to one of our audience questions, actually. The question is, starting with a comment, disruptive behavior in schools or classrooms is, can be a major problem and a barrier to effective learning. What principles should guide us in improving this situation while retaining an equity lens? I think I'll go first on that one. Um, I believe, and as a, I started my career off as a, um, I was a social worker and then I was a teaching assistant at a school where 
students who struggled were there. That was a whole population. And I believe that the underlying um, conditions or antecedents to what is going on for students. And I think that, you know, uh, another elephant in the room is special ed. You know, there's a lot of students in special ed. Special ed's over representative of minorities. And sometimes we just don't understand the developmental um, underpinnings of kids. And I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'll give an example. I mean, uh, if you have a communication disorder, it's probably not a good idea to talk to that person verbally a lot. Because they have a communication disorder, gestures come before language. And it's not like we don't necessarily use that kind of thinking in school. If a student has a motor issues or has difficulty getting up and going somewhere, um, when you're pressuring them to get up and go, there's probably going to be a fallout of some kind. So I think that there's other ways to, behavior is communication. So what are kids communicating to us and are we pushing them past thresholds? And I remember going into classrooms and saying, well, where's, where's the threshold for this student? And they're, what do you mean? Well, we need to know what the threshold is and I don't know, I don't want to push past it because I don't want, I don't want to see that student. I mean, it's hard for the student and it's hard for the teacher and it's hard for the people that they just want to do what's right and help but I don't think that we look deep enough into development and um, antecedents of what's, what's really going on with kids. Okay. Anyone else care to offer something? It's a big topic. <laughs> um, uh, Thursdays you can catch on KGW as they follow uh, one of our schools uh, inside Woodlawn Elementary. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of aspects to how do we make sure and serve uh, all students um, and you kind of have to go upstream also uh, we need greater access to high quality preschool and early education opportunities it doesn't exist uh, uh, universally uh, certainly in the Portland metro area um, but how do we establish school communities that really have uh, the therapeutic ability uh, and the tiered behavioral and mental health supports uh, uh, how do we have educators that can wrap themselves around with a knowledge base about the kind of trauma-informed practices that they need to to demonstrate when when they work with with our students? Um, so, so part of it is, uh, and a big, in large part, on 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 the adults to to really understand that. Uh, and it's not something that uh, you can go deeply into mastering in, in a teacher education program. So we have to continue uh, to pay attention to that. Um, uh, in my own principalship, over 500 uh, students in an underserved uh, majority African American neighborhood, um, I also hosted this district's uh, program for what was formally categorized as emotionally disturbed students. Now when you have 85 of your 500 students all with documented severe trauma, you have to rethink what kind of a school principal you're going to be to really meet their needs. And so one of the first things I did was to make sure that we have those behavioral health and mental health partnerships, but that we sit around the table with our parents and our families to have that conversation. And then not only do we have to talk about curriculum and instructional pedagogy, but the work as educators very much had to talk about not just the cultural responsiveness by which we do our work, but how do we recognize, understand, address, and support um, those trauma, uh, those traumas that can, can that can uh, exhibit themselves, and so how do we promote the more pro-social behaviors that uh, that our students also need support in, in learning? Uh, that has to become part of our work too. But uh, we increasingly see that with housing instability, uh, with addiction, uh, with interrupted schooling. Um, that these are becoming, uh, these behaviors are becoming increasingly uh, a part of uh, the challenges that, that our schools need to think about. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, with an installment of some new investments, this will be an important bucket 
uh, of resources uh, uh, that will go into some of these kinds of supports and interventions. So every school has the tools and ability uh, to address students early on and we're not, that isn't one classroom teacher's job alone to really think about all of our students. Well, thank you for that response because it leads to another audience question, which is, um, what opportunities do you ha see in the new Student Success Act passed by our legislature, and what role can the Department of Education play in helping districts and schools achieve the goals and meet the challenges that you've described in these various comments? So, uh, Matt, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, I think one of the, you know, I, what I appreciate about uh, how the state is setting up the uh, Student Success uh, Act, particularly the, the Student Investment Act portion of that investment uh, account, uh, is they're requiring us to go out and seek community input uh, from our students, from our staff, uh, from our parents, from our community, uh, are really kind of around five key areas. Uh, and um, you know, obviously, uh, Social emotional support, counseling, mental health is is a, a a piece that seems to be rising, you know, to the top right now. Um, and you know what what I and we will I think in North Clackamas uh, will will be looking at how can we provide those su more supports for our, for our students. Uh, until this last year, we had half time counselors in most of our elementary schools. So I had a, half-time counselor for 550 students. Um, I have middle school, you know, until this year, I had, I had a middle school uh, where it was a one to 600 ratio for a counselor to students. Um, national average, right, the way, what the national accreditation says for counseling services, I think is one to, one counselor to 250 students. Um, we're nearly double that. Uh, in our school system. Uh, so that's a critical component. Uh, but it's not only uh, counselors, it is social workers, it is mental health providers, it is trauma-informed care experts uh, in our system that, uh, what, you know, I think will be a critical area for us. But it's also, you know, it's what Guadalupe re referenced. Um, you know, we have addiction issues in, in our country in the opioid crisis. We have, uh, you know, homeless issues and affordable housing issues. Our families need support. Um, our kids, you know, our students are with us for six, six and a half hours a day. And then where do they go uh, for the remaining, you know, 18 hours of their day? And um, we've got to figure out in our country and in our community and in our state uh, how we're supporting our families. Um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be a, uh, a tool for the Student Success Act, but um, it is a bigger issue that I think we need to wrestle with as a community. In addition to that, you know, uh, class sizes remain too large uh, in Oregon, uh, some of the largest in the country. Um, I, I believe uh, you know, a lot of districts will, will be using these resources to lower class sizes, um, create uh, fewer, uh, inter, you know, try to lessen the number of interactions and the anxiety that happens when you have 35 kids in a class room uh, and you might be a student who has an emotional uh, disturbance uh, diagnosis that's a lot of interaction and a lot of energy and a lot of noise that happens being able to lower our class sizes will be critical uh, looking at early learning uh, efforts uh, we you know it would be wonderful if we could become a state that actually provides preschool for every single child in our state uh, would be fantastic and give our students a heads up on kindergarten and a step forward in kindergarten I think will be critical uh, as well. So those are, those are some thoughts that, that we're wrestling with in our school district. And the, if we could shift on that same question a little bit to some of the other academic supports that you might see from the Student Success Act, what, what are the rest of you thinking about that aspect of it? Well, it's an important installment and investment. It moves us in the right direction. We're not going to resolve all the gaps that exist, but we, what we are going to be able to do is invest in some of the things that Matt described. I know districts have been trying to fill those gaps for, for years. 
so hopefully you'll start to see some of those direct service supports and interventions to students. It could be reading specialists, uh, it could be counselors. Um, I know that we'd like to see extended learning opportunities. So in our underserved communities, we know that there are opportunity gaps, so why wouldn't we give them another six weeks uh, offering uh, during the summer uh, with a, a different kind of personalized learning experience, for example. Uh, but there are other bucket areas uh, uh, for the Student Success Act that are also going to have a direct bearing on the programming that we can offer uh, our students, and, and one of those is the workforce development uh, and diversity effort. Uh, which I have to think about. Uh, we have 4,421 African American students who identify as such, and I think you all know that the profession is majority white female, and so we have. And as one of eight superintendents of color in the entire state, with 197 school districts, you know, I do think about how do we make sure that our students have at least one time in their educational career a teacher of color. Um, and it makes a difference for everybody. So this is going to allow us to do some of the things, some of the innovation. I know I've had the opportunity to lead in my former districts, uh, certainly continue to expand our para-to-teacher programming so that we're supporting uh, particularly uh, paraprofessionals of color who have dedicated their lives, oftentimes 10, 15, 20 years in the classroom, but haven't had the support to get their own teaching credential to run their own classrooms. Uh, oftentimes, uh, members of the community themselves aspire administrators, uh, principals networks, and professional learning communities so that they can continue uh, to talk about their leadership practice and all the way up the career ladder. Uh, so that's something we're looking forward to, to promoting there as well. There are a couple of other bucket areas uh, that are equity oriented, uh, an opportunity for us to enhance and expand uh, with culturally uh, specific community organizations with which we already partner, but we know there's greater need uh, in some of our other schools that don't have have that kind of access as well. The state previously worked on an African American student success plan, followed by a native student success plan, and now a Latinx student success plan. It never funded them. So this is going to be another opportunity to, to do some substantive work uh, in those areas as well. And then, of course, the third bucket being the, the early education. So hopefully you'll be able to see in some of our underserved communities access to many more seats for our four-year-olds. Thank you. Um, it's time to end the question and answer section of this, and I'd like to give each of you, starting um, with Lisa and then Kevin and then Matt and Guadalupe, two minutes to wrap up. Okay. Well, I have enjoyed listening to the thoughts about education for our students and families in, in Oregon. And there was a couple of things that I, as I, uh, as I reflect, one of them is it would be really nice to see students and family voices uh, to be heard in a really authentic way where they are informing some of the decisions. And I know we have listening sessions and we gather people, but I always wonder who's not gathered. Like who's not here and how do we uh, wrap around and make sure that people are here. I also uh, wonder about our community organizations or our culturally specific organizations. Do we have uh, you know, commonality amongst them? And are we getting bang for the buck when we are working with um, our culturally specific groups or groups that support us? And then lastly, what I wonder about is we talked about students and we, I've heard trauma-informed care and I've, I've heard a wrap around about them, but our teachers also need the same kind of support that our students need. Um, they are continually um, showing up and they have their own trauma and sometimes that's what shows up in school. So a lot of my work is in the future will be to wrap around school systems, um, including the organization, looking for gaps, teachers, students, and families. Thank you, Lisa. Kevin? I think I noticed, looking out in the crowd, some of my mentors from when I, when I first started teaching in Portland way back in 1986. And um, what I learned from them um, that I've kind of transformed into my own words and something that guided me um, through my career was that I never met a student that didn't want to be successful. I never met a teacher that didn't want to be successful with students. And I never met a parent that didn't want the best for their kids. And when I operated from that place, I was willing to meet, meet 
all those stakeholders wherever they were at and 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 then we grow we grow together from there i didn't get a chance to to comment on the student success act but what i can say is that at at um three to phd you know we we really are we have been in the process of implementing a lot of and trying um, a lot of what the Student Success Act uh, calls for, um, we do through through our operational budget have a full time social worker who's on staff, works with the counselors, works with the clinic, works with the food pantry, um, all throughout, and has seen you know in some capacity um, up to twenty percent of the families, um, not only in just direct services of of food, clothing, diapers, um, those kind of needs, but also also, um, there's a cultural component to what she does that's, that's pretty incredible and amazing that, that has really made her, to me, embodies that, that Student Success Act. We're also, um, as the Student Success Act calls for with community engagement, we have the opportunity to bring together college students, Fabian students, Fabian parents. Um, staff from all those partners that are part of this collaborative to come together at, and because no no one person has there's no one one blanket you know solution to all of this it really is wrapping your heads around your community needs and, and adapting that um, the last thing I know is that there there are people in the audience who are really concerned about um, um, African American student learning and um, I know between North Clackamas and Portland Public Schools, there's about 7,000 um, African American students that get served, and and we're worried. We're worried, and you know, oftentimes the when I approach students, the I have to look at what was my experience in in the public school system. You know, I, I did K-12 public school, then I went to um, Oregon State, graduated from Oregon State, just started teaching in in Portland Public Schools in 1986. And, you know, the only thing I can think about is, is, is somewhere along the way, I developed agency where I could advocate for myself. And we talked a lot about that, um, about empowering students. And, and, and so where did my agency come from, right? Where did that academic identity come from? And I've thought a lot about that and have thought about how do we how do we instill that in students? Because if we want their best on any kind of standardized test, um, their best in school, their best in sports, their best in the arts, they got to feel like they belong and that they um, are a part of 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 the school, the community that they are that they're operating in. And and lastly, there are measures to measure that. You know, and, and, and when I was at Boise, we were part of Portland Metro STEM network, and they had um, measures of self-efficacy, and we gave those to our students so we could measure how we were doing. Um, the kids would give us feedback on how they felt about themselves as a learner and how they felt about their motivation um, in school, and that could direct how we um, approached instruction, how we approached our school, and we built around that more so than we did um, um, the S back. So anyway, but I will remember <laughs> now. <laughs> Which I'm very grateful we have MAP now. I just want to say Superintendent Guerrero that we needed that interim assessment to, that's a little more diagnostic and and we can uh, look at student uh, progress. Thank you, Kevin. Yep. Matt, your two minutes. Uh, I became an educator and a teacher in the state of Oregon in 1989. And in 1990, uh, Measure 5 passed. Mm -hmm. And for 30 years in my career, I have been making cuts uh, in our educational system. Um, I think back in 2003, 2005, uh, education made up 45% of the state's budget. Uh, by the last by name, it was down to 38, I think, percent of the state's budget. And that's been the reality. Um, when I uh, started my educational career, um, many believed Oregon uh, was an excellent educational system, and I don't think we would say that today. And I believe it's a direct correlation to where we're putting our resources. Um, that brings us to today, um, where after 30 years of advocacy, um, we have a significant investment in our K-12 system. 
and I am probably more optimistic now than I have been uh, at any other time in my career, not only for the resources that we have, but I think we have a greater understanding um, of what our educational system needs to be today. Um, We have shifted from, again, the traditional education system uh, that was designed uh, by uh, white people uh, for white people. And um, we now understand the damage that has done to our students and to our communities. Uh, And and so I I think we are at a critical moment in which we can take these new investments uh, and use them like we haven't been, that we have not used them in the past uh, to affirm the identity of our students, to create belonging in our school systems, uh, to create those deep roots in our students uh, where they're going to be able to transform our society. And we're gonna do that by teacher support, at least that you referenced. Uh, Teachers are the most critical components of our system and they need uh, just as much support as our uh, as our students do, uh, and along with that, how do we bring our families and our community into these conversations and become these communities that we've all talked about tonight? Uh, making sure that every voice is heard in our community and every voice is part of the decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Guadalupe, <laughs> your two minutes, please. Well, it's a privilege uh, to do this work. Um, It's an honor to get up and clock in that 12-hour day every day because it's another opportunity to make an exponential difference, which is the line you typically hear educators give because it's a noble profession. Um, I I have to agree wholeheartedly with with Kevin's description about uh, our task is really to help our students find their voice, discover their gifts, their talents, and to cultivate those, right? I I think about my own uh, uh, young adult uh, children uh, back in San Francisco uh, whose parents are both educators, but uh, they don't need us to advocate for them. Uh, They have what you would describe as a very strong sense of self-efficacy and agency. Um, And so our task as uh, system leaders is how do we create the conditions so that any one of uh, every one of our students and every one of our educators has the personalized supports that they need to be successful. And so a principal has to think about that, a supervisor of schools and superintendents uh, have to think, particularly at this moment in time right now, how do we leverage these precious dollars, having been in California working under Prop 13, which is the equivalent of Measure 5, but having spent a decade leading schools in Massachusetts, which has continued to be the top performing state for 15, 20 years, and you know their investment looks a lot different. Uh, and so uh, there are some evidence-based practices out there that, that we know will, will make a difference, um, but the task and the charge and, and the mandate that we have is, is clear. Um, let's create the conditions for every one of our students to have that kind of experience uh, that will enable them to be the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the recorded part of our panel discussion on educational innovations. Uh, Join me once again in thanking our panelists for helping us understand the opportunities and challenges. Please find the schedule for the broadcast on the back table and also visit LWV pdx.org to find the schedule there for the Metro East Community Media um, rebroadcast. We would like to thank, thank Metro East Community Media for the recordings and for this meeting funded by the Multnomah Bar Foundation and the Carroll and Velma Sailing Foundation. And we also thank Multnomah County for the use of the venue and our audience and volunteers for your support. And I guess I have a personal word to everyone. If you don't already um, volunteer for the schools, please think about it. They obviously have presented a compelling case for each of us to get involved. Thank Thank you you all.